we discussed. And we hope you enjoy the, the session ahead and the day ahead as well. Ladies and gentlemen, namaskar and welcome to the third day of the Jaipur Literature Festival 2023 at the front lawn. And we begin the conversations of the day with the elephant and the dragon, a connected history, Tan Sen Sen, JJ Singh, and Shyam Saran in conversation with William Dalrymple. China and India have for centuries been the two greatest economic powers of the world. And in the 21st century, their joint superpower status is likely to return. But while their histories and civilizations have traditionally been closely intertwined, today they are almost strangers to each other, and their relations bejeweled by misunderstandings and military tensions at the border. Three of India's most distinguished observers of China peer into the past and look into the future with historian and festival director William Dalrymple. Our first speaker today, Mr. Tan Sen Sen, is a professor of history, the director of, of the Center for Global Asia at New York University, Shanghai, and associate professor of history at New York University. He's the author of books like Buddhism, Diplomacy and Trade, The Realignment of Sino-Indian Relations, China and the World, A Connected History. Our second speaker today, Mr. J.J. Singh, former governor of Arunachal Pradesh, is a highly decorated army general with over 48 years of contribution to nation building and who was chief of army staff. Endowed with a vision for strategic defense relations, the defense industry, and modernization of the defense forces, he has contributed significantly towards the evolution of our national defense and security policy. Our third and final speaker today, Mr. Sam Saran, a Padma Bhushan awardee, is a former Foreign Secretary of India and has served as the Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Nuclear Affairs and Climate Change. He is currently the President of the India International Center and an Ordinary Senior Fellow with the Center for Policy Research. He has recently published his second book, How China Sees India and the World. Our moderator, while needs no introduction, I will still try to do justice with the next five lines. Mr. William Dalrymple is the author of the Wolfson Prize-winning White Mughals, Duff Cooper Prize-winning The Last Mughal, and the Hemingway and Kapuscinski Prize-winning Return of a King. His book, The Anarchy, was shortlisted for the Duke of Wellington Medal and the Tata Book of the Year and the Historical Writers Association Award. He's also a member of several royal societies and has held visiting lectureships at Princeton, Brown, and Oxford, where he's currently an honorary Bodleian Fellow. He's also the founder and co-director of the Jeff Literature Festival. Ladies and gentlemen, our first conversation of the day, The Elephant and the Dragon, A Connected History, Tan Sen Sen, JJ Singh, and Sham Saran in conversation with William Dalrymple. As an outsider coming to this country, I was often very startled how obsessed India seemed to be with Pakistan, and in a sense, ignoring the much larger giant to, uh, to, to, the, to the right, to uh, above in China. And particularly, I think, today in strategic terms, uh, one gets the impression that India still regards Pakistan as, as uh, the great threat, possibly uh, only now waking up to uh, the enormous possibilities and dangers posed by the rise of China as an astonishingly uh, advanced and powerful superpower. The question of India-China relations is an incredibly intricate uh, historical tangle. But in this session, we're going to focus in uh, on three periods uh, and try and understand um, what seemed to me to be the three crucial moments of India-China relations. We're going to start with Tanzan Sen, um, whose works, have, I should say, have been guiding me in my current research, probably more than any other author, uh, as I've been working on my current book, The Golden Road, an astonishing scholar uh, of early relations, I mean, a, a, a scholar of Indo-China relations over the entire period, as his uh, most recent book, uh, A Connected History. Um, demonstrates, but a specialist particularly in the early Buddhist period uh, and how the whole question of how Buddhism uh, arrived in China was transformed by China. Uh, and um, I have had huge pleasure reading his work um, 
both the, all the, the, the books and these incredible stream of articles that he's produced, all different, um, about all the various people that have connected the two worlds over centuries. Uh, and I cannot wait uh, to talk to him today. Sham Saran needs no introduction to this audience, one of our regulars uh, and a huge friend of the festival, um, former foreign secretary. But today uh, we're talking about how China sees India and the world, which only came out in the autumn, uh, is bang up to date, uh, and is a brilliant short assessment uh, of the issues we'll be talking about today. I'm going to be asking Sham Saran particularly about what went wrong in uh, Indo-China relations in 1962, uh, the whole question of the war and the aftermath, uh, and where that leaves us. Uh, and then we're going to turn to my neighbor in, in Chattapur, um, who I should say, uh, with, with no uh, bribery intent, uh, sent me a delicious box of French cheese last week. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to make sure he appears every year at the Jai Pulitzer Festival if he continues to send me breeze and uh, delicious bottles of French wine. Uh, the great General J.J. Singh, four-star general, whose book, The McMahon Line, uh, is a spectacular look at uh, uh, the, the, the colonial line which now divides uh, India and China and the repercussions. The, we all, we've heard a great deal about the Durand line, of which many, many books have been written, um, which separating Pakistan and Afghanistan. But I think the McMahon line is much less well known, uh, and this is a, a, a fantastic entry into this. And of course, uh, with the general, we're going to ask for a realistic assessment uh, of the current strategic balance between India and China. Um, is China's, uh, is China's technological prowess something that we really should be worried about in this country and for the future of world peace? Or uh, is the uh, Indian military well up to any challenges posed by China uh, and can we relax? This is the question we will end with. And I'll ask all of these gentlemen to look into their crystal balls at the end and, and uh, uh, t tell us their fears and hopes for the future. So Tanzan, starting with you, the I, growing up again in the West, I was very much aware in the aftermath of, of uh, Joseph Needham, um, I was, he was still bent back in keys when I was at Trinity as an undergraduate 30, 30 40 years ago, um, that China produced an extraordinary number of the most crucial inventions, paper, gunpowder, and so on, which changed uh, the life of the West. But when you look at the relationship from here, it's a slightly different paradigm because many of the most important aspects of Chinese culture originated here in India and no, nothing more important than Buddhism. Do you want to give a little sketch of how Buddhism diffused up into China, both overland and by the less thought of, but something you've written a great deal of, uh, the maritime route. Right, but that will need another volume. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I wanted to thank you for, for inviting me. Last time we did this was online um, and, and we had a nice session, but in person is really fabulous. It's amazing to see the people here and meeting uh, Mr. J. J. Singh, General J. J. Singh here. I've known Ambassador Saran since the 1980s. In the introduction, they did not tell you he was a very good batsman. Uh, we used to have a cricket team, and, and he was our Rahul Dravid. Uh, it was very difficult to get him out uh, at, at that point, so uh, it's nice to see him here. Uh, but the history of, of Buddhism um, uh, is, is a very interesting process where an ideology that is foreign to China makes a mark in China. How that happens, given the fact that China already had Taoism and Confucianism, why would it accept a foreign religion? Right? Uh, and, and that's the fascinating aspect of the entry of Buddhism, which happens around the first century CE. Uh, and the process is very complex and interesting at the same time. The language used, for example, was not Sanskrit, uh, but Chinese. Um, I usually give a talk called Why Buddhism and Not Hinduism in China, uh, re reason for the success of, of, of Buddhism penetrating the Chinese society. I think language is, is a crucial element, how the Buddhist monks, not only from South Asia, but Central Asia and, and later on Southeast Asia, contributed to the translation of Buddhist texts. I think that process of translating uh, Buddhist works from India Indian Buddhist works into Chinese was the reason uh, that Buddhism really became successful. The other reason, and I, I need to emphasize this, uh, comparing uh, what happens in Southeast Asia and China, 
in Southeast Asia, as many of you know, Hinduism was a dominating factor, but it was a very top-down process in which Brahminism or Hinduism spread in Southeast Asia. Buddhism in China was bottom-up. Uh, so the initial stages of Buddhism in China that you see uh, is uh, perhaps people thinking of Buddha as a deity and, and incorporating Buddha as part of their various many gods and goddesses. And so a very interesting part of the early Buddhism in China is the use of Buddha in the tombs, in the Chinese tombs. Uh, I don't think Buddha would like that, uh, but nonetheless, that's how the Chinese people uh, incorporated uh, uh, Buddhism into their pantheon. Uh, and by the fifth century, the number of people practicing Buddhism at the lower levels were really, really high. So I would say between the first and the fifth century, the bottom up and the translation activities would be the foundation for the spread of Buddhism, the successful spread of Buddhism to China. Tell me about some of the early translators. Who were these men that were taking two languages that couldn't be more different from each other, Sanskrit and Chinese? Uh, there were very few bilingual specialists at that time, knowing Sanskrit uh, or Pali and, and Chinese. So there was a whole team uh, that uh, sat together uh, translating Buddhist texts. So somebody would recite the text. Many of the texts did not exist. It was, it was in memory. Somebody would recite, and then somebody would translate uh, it into Chinese or perhaps Central Asian language first. Uh, and then somebody would write it down. And then there would be a fourth person editing the translation. Uh, so it was a process uh, that involved four to five people sitting down. It's kind of a workshop that we do these days, like, like four of us here uh, translating a text. And there were many problems. How do you uh, translate certain words, even places? How do you translate Rajgir uh, or Nalanda into Chinese? Right? Chinese people don't know the geography of, of, of India. So some of the early translators were actually Central Asians uh, who knew both languages. And, could... and some of mixed blood. Um, mixed blood, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. So Kumar Jiva, for example, was a mixed blood, and then he plays a very important role in translating some of the very important texts. And he was one of the more competent translators uh, in, in China. And has an incredibly sort of tragic life. He's twice, not once, but twice enslaved and captured. Yes, everybody wanted him, right? You know, uh, nowadays I, I don't think people care about translators, but he was much sought after, and everybody wanted him. So he was born in, is it Khotan or? Yeah, yeah, in Kota yeah. uh, and, and uh, uh, Kucha and, and Turfan, Kucha, northern yeah. part. Uh, and, and then he had... Where there's wonderful caves. Yes, there are caves, wonderful yeah. caves yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, and they're kind of extraordinary. They're kind of, the, of all the caves in that region, they're the one that most like sort of uh, California acid trips. You've got all these levitating monks and, uh, and floating figures with sort of weird geese and going over the moon. It's a, it's a very sort of trippy no, series I, I, of I think minerals. A, a more famous one is in Tunhuang. Yeah, uh, Tunhuang also, caves yeah. are, are important not only for the paintings, but also a cave where they found lots of Buddhist texts. Uh, and our information about what was happening in the 7th, 8th century, all the way until the Tibetans came and occupied that area, uh, comes from that cave. We should say, actually, because I think it's not as well known as it should be, that uh, half of Oral Stein's hall from Dunhuang ended up here in Delhi and has only about twice ever been shown. It's been sitting in a, in a storage in, uh, on Jampat, I mean, on, on Rajpat. And this year, for the first time, Lily Pandey, the current uh, culture minister, has erected the most spectacular series of galleries in the National Museum, putting these treasures from Bezalik and Dunhuang and Kutcha uh, on show. And there's three very, very well displayed galleries of Central Asian material. And I remember there was one occasion in the, in the late, 90, uh, late, eight, late 80s when it went up, and, and I saw a little glimpse of it then. But since these galleries are spectacular, anyone wants to know a bit more, you only have to head to the National Museum, uh, and there it is. Tell, tell us about this figure who is probably the most famous icon of, of Indo-China relations, Xuanzang. Who was he, and, and, and what, what was the reason for his journey to... Yeah, I, I think everybody in India knows Xuanzang, Xuanzang, uh, the monk, uh, the Chinese monk who traveled to India uh, in the seventh century. Uh, so Xuanzang has, has different lives. He has one life and multiple afterlives, because his afterlives are also very important. As many of you know, he came to India, traveled across India, wrote this travelogue, which is perhaps the most important Chinese writing on India in the seventh century. Even Indian, I, I do history, so even looking at Indian history, 
his writings are quite important, right? Some of the people who discovered many of the Buddhist sites uh, uh, actually read his book to find out where Nalanda was, where Rajgir was. His book, uh, his travelogue became... Cunningham actually located Cunningham. the site of Nalanda yes. by reading yes. a 7th seven, a seven century travelogue. It's right, a uh, Cunningham, yeah. uh, the major archaeologist, was actually tracing his his, his itinerary and, and finding places that had, he had mentioned. So his travelogue in particular is absolutely important to understand uh, how the Chinese viewed uh, India in the seventh century. In fact, he has a very interesting discourse on the name of India yeah. uh, and then how we should name India, not Tenchu, which was heavenly bamboo. And he, sh he used a contemporary name for, for India in China, Hindu, uh, which he said comes from the moon. He was wrong with that. But uh, so his writing in particular is absolutely important to understand not only India, China, but Central Asia as well. But equally important is his afterlife. After he dies, he becomes an important figure, especially to the Japanese. So Japanese start understanding India through what Xuanzang had written. No Japanese had visited India before the 17th century. So their perception of India came from the writings of Xuanzang and other monks. They drew various diagrams, they drew maps. So that was one of his afterlife. And I'll end with this, in 1950s, uh, the Dalai Lama, who is an important controversial figure now, was interested by Chon Lai to give a relic uh, of Xuanzang uh, to Nehru. Yeah. And that yeah. relic of Xuanzang from his skull is now in Bihar. So yeah. uh, William said, you should go to Delhi and then see the, the oral <laughs> Stein uh, manuscripts. I say, you can go to Patna uh, and you can see the relic of Xuanzang who continues to exist in India. I think he was a champion for India. If you look at his writings on India, he was speaking on behalf of India in the Tang Dynasty. Tanzan, um, Xuanzang is determined to get to one place in particular, Nalanda. Now, there's a lot of mythology about Nalanda. People talk very blithely about it being a university rather than a monastery. Uh, how far was it the uh, was it a university as well as or, or was it a Mahavira uh, uh, a great monastery? Uh, I don't know if you know this. I was part of the Nalanda governing board uh, when the the revival of Nalanda University uh, was formulated. Uh, so we worked for a couple of years on on doing that. It was certainly uh, a, a place of higher education. That's what I would say. Perhaps the earliest such place in the world. Uh, because it was not just Buddhism that was being taught. Astronomy, medicine, not related to Buddhism, was also taught there. So I would say that's a place where you would go to get educated in many different subjects and not just Buddhism. And what happens if someone just turns up at Nalanda and wants to have a quick look? You Is he allowed be, in? <laughs> no, you have to be qualified. You have to take your SATs and GREs, uh, the, the uh, Nalanda version of it, uh, to get into it. There's uh, a fierce gatekeeper. Yeah, yeah. They, it's a good gatekeeper. You have to maintain the standard and quality, <laughs> right? Otherwise, people will go somewhere else. <laughs> and, he, I mean, this specifically, the, Nalanda and one teacher is the reason why Swazang. He's, he's after a particular Yogacara text. Yeah, Yogacara was one of the things that interested uh, Xuanzang. The reason uh, he, he came to India was to learn about this new philosophy uh, called Yogacara that was being promoted in India. Uh, and even after he goes back, he exchanges the letters with, with his teachers in Nalanda. Uh, one of the letters says, you, you know, I dropped uh, this sutra when I was crossing the Indus. Can I have another copy of it? Uh, so the letters exchanged between his teachers in Nalanda and Xuanzang is also quite fascinating how he keeps in touch with his teachers in Nalanda. And we have not just Xuanzang's own account of it, we also have a biography, which is the longest biography of any pre-colonial figure in, in Chinese history, is that not right? Yes, uh, uh, that biography of Xuanzang is a sort of exaggeration of his life as many biographies perhaps at that time did. Uh, but it's an interesting way to see how uh, Xuanzang is becoming a divine figure. He works miracles, he works magic. So I think the biography has to be read as an afterlife of Xuanzang uh, as well. As that, that was the first one that actually influenced many people who were followers of Buddhism in East Asia. And when he gets back, having left very furtively, uh, dodging border guards, sneaking at night through between towers, trying to get water where he can. On the way back, he comes as a sort of conquering hero on an elephant uh, with all these texts, with all these early statues. 
Describe the welcome he's given by the Tang Dynasty is now established uh, in Xi'an, um, in Chang'an. Uh, what kind of life does he lead on the way back? Well, he is a major figure. I mean, uh, what William said initially, uh, this is the first perhaps India-China border issue. The Xuanzang did not get his visa uh, <laughs> to leave, uh, leave China and he had to escape. That's what William was referring to. Uh, he just escaped in the middle of the night because he didn't get his uh, passport sealed. Uh, but when he comes back, he is received as a hero. Uh, and he is afraid before going back to Xi'an that he will be arrested. So he writes to the emperor that, you know, can I come back? Uh, okay, uh, you know, I escaped, I did not have the right papers. Uh, and the emperor said, please come. And then he is supposed to have gone to the gate to receive Xuanzang. This is a major emperor in, in, in China. And he becomes a hero. And then the emperor even tries to convince him that he should work for the state and fight the Koreans uh, because of his magical powers. Uh, but Xuanzang says, sorry, uh, you know, I have other works to do. I have to translate all the 650 textbooks that I brought from <laughs> India. Uh, but he is always close to the emperor. Uh, that emperor and his son, who, who continues to serve as the ruler of Tang. So he's very close to the court throughout his life. The first book by Tanz that I read was his wonderful Diplomacy and Trade. And um, it sounds like a rather dry book, but in that there is the most salacious story uh, of what follows next. Because one of um, Tazong's concubines, uh, who is then only 15, um, manages somehow to escape from the nunnery into which she's put uh, after the death of the emperor become the concubine, then the wife, then the empress of the next emperor, and becomes a major patron of Buddhism and a major cultural figure in her own life. Will you tell a little yes, about uh, Wu Zetian? This is uh, Wu Zetian, who is the first female ruler of China from 690 to 705. Very, very efficient person uh, as far as administration is concerned, but because the Confucian scholars did not like a woman to be a ruler, uh, has, have portrayed her as a negative figure killing many different people, but she had, she had a problem. How could she, as a female, become the ruler of a very male-dominated Con Confucian society? Uh, so she manipulated various Buddhist texts with... I mean, quite shamelessly. Uh, with, with, yes, with her boyfriend, <laughs> Buddhist monk, right? Um, and it's amazing <laughs> that the relationship that, that this uh, uh, empress had with a Buddhist monk, who then brings in various Central Asian and Indian monks to fake a sutra. And, first, and, and the daisies in, in the capital are quite happy to produce completely fabulous translations yeah, of yeah, proving that she's the, 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 the Bodhisattva Maitreya. So she is, she yeah. is the future Buddha, Maitreya. <laughs> so they portray her in this... Uh, this uh, they have to show that she is actually a legitimate heir to the throne. How can you do that? Uh, she can't be a Confucian person. So they say she is the future Buddha coming alive. And they then create various kinds of statues uh, that resemble her, right? So this is a really very interesting project, a trans-regional project, uh, Chinese, Indian, Central Asian, uh, all coming together. And this is, would you say, one of the main high points of the Indo-China, that you have many Indians with very senior jobs in Chang'an, including the Astronomer Royal. The yeah, so around 700, I would say, is the peak of uh, the ancient China-India relations. Uh, it's not only various monks. Uh, very fascinatingly, there are three uh, families of Indian astronomers working at the Tang court, uh, interpreting the skies. Um, uh, Indians have always been very good in maths, right? Uh, still, they are. Uh, and they are mathematically calculating the movement of stars to tell the emperor, number of different emperor, how they should behave, or what policies they should institute. So yes, if you can see the period when India really dominated China culturally, uh, scientifically, unlike what Needham says, is the 7th, 8th centuries. So to go, in a sense, from the high point of Indo-China relations, to jump forward 2000, no, 1,400 years um, to one of the low points, Sham Saran, tell us the story of the lead up to 1962, because the British leave India, and initially there are high hopes that uh, China and India will be brothers and friends, maybe opposed to the West and the colonial world, but it doesn't work out that way. What happens? Well, just before we leave the Tang Dynasty, uh, one other important uh, sign of Indian dominance of the Chinese scene was that the most popular song in the Tang capital was the love song of the river Ganges. 
So this is sort of Bollywood, concrete uh, China. <laughs> so apparently it was the most popular song and it had come from this place called Pucha, uh, where uh, there, were, there were a large number of Indians who were residing at that time. And, um, you know, Indian music was very popular. Brilliant. So, <laughs> uh, so before we leave the Thang dynasty, I thought this should be also be taken uh, note of. Uh, so let's uh, jump to, um, you know, the uh, early uh, period after, you know, India became independent in 1947 and China had its liberation in 1949. What were the impressions which the Chinese had of India at that juncture? So it's something very interesting uh, that was narrated to me by a China uh, scholar, a scholar of Indi Indian uh, uh, politics and Indian history. Uh, she told me uh, when I said, you know, it seems that China does not appear to believe that India has any kind of independent agency, that somehow the colonial mentality still lingers on in uh, India. And she said, you know, for China, it's very difficult to understand that you became an independent country in 1947, throwing off the yoke of British colonialism. How come the British, last British governor general was the first head of state of independent India? How could this be? Um, and with British military figures still... Yeah, continue to, uh, you know, lead the uh, Indian army uh, for some time. Um, another uh, puzzle for the Chinese was, um, you know, the British Indian army continued as if nothing had happened. Uh, you had a civil service in India, which was still, you know, the uh, legacy of the British uh, colonial administration. So isn't it a somewhat legitimate of us to question, has re India really become independent of Britain? And I think it is sometimes worthwhile to put yourself in the shoes of the Chinese to see why they have certain kind of ideas about, uh, about India. Um, <clears throat> throughout, I think, this period, <clears throat> going back even to the canonial period, there was always this sense that, uh, you know, India is not an independent agent. Despite uh, the, despite the <coughs> non-aligned movement, despite Nehru uh, so leading, were the, two, leading the post-colonial world. During the colonial period, there were two strands of thinking amongst Chinese. You know, the Chinese who were now emerging from the old, you know, Qing Empire. They wanted reform in, in China. Uh, one particular section, uh, thought that India was, as I have written in my book, a teacher by negative example. That China's future should not be what India has become. That it was a great ancient civilization, and yet it had become a slave nation. Why did it become a slave nation? You know, that is a question to be asked, and we should study that. People like Hang Yo Wei, for example, wrote extensively about how in China's future should not be what India has uh, become. Uh, so there was this one, uh, one strain uh, of thinking that, uh, you know, uh, one sh China should avoid whatever India is. The second strand was, of course, people who thought that we were both facing the same Western challenge imperial, imp of imperialism, of the cultural challenge of the West. And therefore, there was a certain kind of an empathy that developed amongst you know, the, leaders, the leaders of China and leaders uh, of India. Both strains uh, were there, but I would say that the dominant strain was in fact the negative uh, strain uh, in, in, in terms of you know, how, how that uh, uh, generation of Chinese looked at uh, India. And Nehru believed he had an understanding with Mao. How did Mao look back at Nehru? No, I think uh, the, uh, the uh, prevailing sort of sentiment amongst the Chinese revolutionary leaders, whether it is Mao or Chou Enlai, was uh, a very negative one of India. They, you know, in the early, early uh, years, uh, Nehru was dis uh, described as a running dog of imperialism. Really? Yeah. So um, we have this picture on the front of Tanzan's book with uh, Mao and Nehru in an open top car. I mean, it's a mythical. Uh, so I think there was a there was a sense that 
you know, uh, India trying to uh, be a non-aligned uh, country, uh, the role that India played, for example, uh, in during the Korean War, you know, the, um, the armistice and the exchange of prisoners, uh, that gave China a sense that India could be a useful country uh, to be friendly with. Uh, it was not as if there was a strong sense of, you know, empathy between the two countries. Look at, uh, for example, some of the writings uh, amongst uh, Chinese scholars about uh, the role that uh, China and India played at the Mangdong Conference, you know. Um, most people in India think that India, India and Nehru actually dominated uh, that uh, that uh, particular was that not meeting. not the case? Uh, not from the Chinese point of view. <laughs> For them, it was Zhou Enlai who was the who was the uh, dramatic figure, and saying that Nehru was trying to be condescending. You know uh, that uh, he was trying to show that you know India was the leading country and he was the leading figure. But actually, you see, it was Zhou Enlai who actually dominated uh, the entire proceedings, and uh, it was he who you know, convinced the world, particularly the developing world, uh, you know, that China was their champion. So and that kind of narrative you can see like a running theme. You know. and, and what role did Tibet then play in... in uh, a a yeah. very critical role, because uh, up to 1959, I mean, it is not as if there were no skirmishes at the border, but, uh, you know, they were not looked upon as of being, being of any kind of a strategic threat. China. That particular, you know, perception changed as a result of the revolt in Tibet and more importantly that the Lai Lama, you know, came to uh, India and was given, given shelter in India with a very large number of other, you know, we should understand that there was a great deal of nervousness, even panic in China as a result of the 1959 uh, Tibet revolt. And, you know, in the, in the subsequent years, for quite some time, the Chinese were not really able to establish uh, control over, over Tibet. Uh, How so quickly what, did, did all those, you know, I mean, what, what, there's all these stories of uh, CIA Indian operations with Tibetan monks and people being trained up, and did that the, happen there quite is, There is no or, doubt no. that the CIA was trying to take advantage of the Tibet revolt and make things difficult uh, for uh, China, and China was very extremely sensitive uh, to that. But all this added up to looking at those border skirmishes and the border dispute from a strategic perspective rather than, you know, just being, you know, tactical moves by both sides. So what were not seen by China as a kind of a strategic threat post-1959, whatever was happening from the Indian side at the border was seen as directed towards undermining Chinese control over Tibet. You know? And so that changed the nature of the border dispute uh, between the two countries and led to 1962. And let me say that if we are looking at a future settlement of the border issue, Tibet will be a critical component of any such understanding between India and China. So let's go to 1962 now. What, what happened? How did it break out into the conflict it became? So, uh, I mean, this is the backdrop uh, that you know, China's sense of threat was heightened as a result of, you know, what was happening in uh, uh, Tibet. But uh, let us also look at the geopolitical context, you know. Uh, the Chinese made certain that, you know, there would be no kind of intervention or involvement safe by the United States in the, uh, in the uh, conflict uh, if, it, if it broke out. Uh, it was also, uh, in, you know, when they, when they considered their relationship with the Soviet Union, it had already become very fraught and very tense. Um, they were, Soviet Union was seen as moving more and more towards India, uh, against uh, China. Which was true. Uh, which was true, but this was the run-up to the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. And so, you know, uh, uh, Soviet Union needed the so-called solidarity of the socialist bloc uh, in that uh, confrontation with the United States. And therefore, they made that famous uh, statement, um, you know, Indians are our friends, but Chinese are our brothers, you know. Uh, and, and so during that particular period, in fact, they chose to be somewhat neutral in the conflict between India and uh, China. And, and one, other, one other point. Uh, we did not look at clues 
uh, as far as the domestic politics of China are concerned, this was the time, don't forget, that we have had the, uh, you know, Great Leap Forward, you have had the Great Famine in China, uh, Mao's own leading position is under threat because people are criticizing all the policies that he has been associated with. He has been, in fact, pushed to what is known as the second line of leadership in China, and he's trying to get back uh, to uh, his, his former preeminent position. What does he do? He starts using his contacts with the PLA to try and get back you know, to a dominant uh, leadership position. And it is during that particular period that this particular this border conflict with China becomes uh, uh, salient because it, there is a there is a Politburo meeting in which actually there is a debate as to whether or not China should actually undertake these military operations against uh, India and there is there is uh, opposition to that because there are people in the Politburo who are arguing that at a time when we are facing difficulties with the Americans and we are facing tensions with the Soviet Union is it wise for us to get into a conflict uh, with India? And uh, this would not be in, in, in China's interest. And it is Mao who, in fact, you know, overrides the opposition and says, you know, this is the right time to strike because, you know, uh, the world is preoccupied and this is the time when we can actually deliver a lesson uh, to uh, India. You know. General. No better person to tell us why it went so badly for India. 1962. Uh, well, firstly, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to be this, on this panel and with this very distinguished audience. Uh, I, I've been 47 years uh, looking at China. All our borders, I've served in all, most all areas. Also, I have been uh, uh, governor of Arunachal Pradesh, three-fourths of which is being claimed by China, and uh, without any uh, real logic. Uh, I would like to start with uh, some comments on uh, Tonsen Sen's uh, book. Uh, he's written a masterpiece, uh, and I browsed through it very briefly, but towards the end, he talks about uh, where the differences are coming in. You see, it's a connect but this is a disconnect, the last portion, and that disconnect starts after the two countries became independent in a way. And uh, second point I want to highlight is he's very well brought out the historical background on Buddhism, uh, advent of Buddhism into China. But what I want to highlight is that Tibet was always our neighbor. China was never our neighbor. There is a very uh, brilliant uh, uh, description of the geography which people don't know. There are five major rivers with deep canyons and snow cap peaks, which is starting from the Irrawaddy, Salween, Mekong, and Yangtze Kiang. And if you had to come from the east, from mainland China to Tibet, you had to cross these canyons, and there were the ferocious Kampa tribes who would make merry help uh, for any outsider to come through there. So the Chinese preferred, till 1954, let me tell you, our government was so naive, we allowed them to bring their army and their logistics through Kalimpong, through Calcutta, and then Kalimpong, Siliguri by train, and then Kalimpong and Chumbi Valley and go to Lhasa. It was a preferred route because of the dangers of the other route. Now I'm trying to tell you that Many of us don't know the geography of this whole area, and you cannot be uh, ever successful in fighting a, a warlike situation if you do not study geography. Then comes the history. Tibetans were a very ferocious race. They were warriors, and they had captured many parts of the uh, subcontinent, including parts of Nepal, India, uh, and the Chinese capital of uh, Xi'an. And uh, the Chinese emperor gave his daughter Wen Cheng in hand of this very powerful king Songsen Gampo. And this lady, the, she was a Buddhist herself, and that talks a lot about the ladies. He also married the, Tibet, uh, the Nepalese princess Brikuti. She was also Tibetan. 
So both these ladies, the power of the ladies, I must say, they made him also pacific and made him a Buddhist. With the result, they lost their warrior instincts and Tibet uh, became very peaceful, but they needed a patron to safeguard them. Choi Jon is the description of this patron and priest relationship. General Webb, I'm looking slightly at the clock here. We've, we have uh, four minutes before questions. Okay. So can we quickly go uh, no. to 1962? Uh, yes. Uh, I was given a little less time. Uh, <laughs> Forgive me. Possibly yeah. I, I need those we'll, three, We'll eat into minutes. questions. Yeah. I will come to the boundary problem. Uh, China and India were never neighbors, as I mentioned. And the boundary between Tibet and India was understood by custom and tradition and usage that this side of the main mountain chain is India and that side is Tibet. And now China is trying to call southern parts of Himalayas in Arunachala, South Tibet. I'm afraid there's no logic in that. It was never historically called South Tibet. In fact, South Tibet was south of Lhasa. Between Lhasa and Himalayas is the Sangpo River, which turns around the uh, uh, Himalayan gorges and comes into and becomes Brahmaputra. So that part between the southern part of uh, the Sangpo River and the Himalayan northern slope was called South Tibet. They are people we cannot trust. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, China is a country which says something but does something else. Hence, we have to be on our guard and which we have learned our lessons after 1962. Now, for example, there are agreements of 1993, 96. These agreements say peace and tranquility on the borders and also talk of confidence building measures. It also specifically says you can't increase troops in your border area more than 20,000. But what they did in Galwan, they brought in two, three divisions. So what I'm trying to tell you is, as a military man, as a strategician, as a person who has studied China for 40 years, we have to be very smart. They are smart. We have to be smarter than them. And then we will succeed each and every time, I can tell you. Our army is uh, capable of giving them a bloody nose, our armed forces, I would say. Uh, if they try to do any misadventure now. 1962 is no more the same situation of the armed forces. And I have to reassure you that they got a bloody nose in Galwan. They were made, stopped in their tracks in Dokala. And they are also uh, being told, similarly in Tawang area, they were told to go back. So this is a new India they are facing. And they must understand that India is no longer the same. General, all that taken in good part. But I, I'm no military man, I don't know, but my impression is that technologically, yes. China is now very advanced weaponry, and India does not yet have a domestic um, arms manufacturing capacity on the same level. H how is India going to face the, the astonishingly advanced yes, PLA? Uh, William, firstly, I will say that uh, no doubt China is technologically advanced, but we eventually have the man manning the machine, the man holding the gun, man holding these technological instruments. The Chinese are not used to fighting in battlefield Tibet. Please understand we are lucky. Our air aeroplanes can carry full loads and bomb China or Tibet. Uh, their uh, aircraft can't take more than half the load. So we have an advantage. Their soldiers are not used to rarefied atmosphere. They carry oxygen bottles as emergency each soldier carries. Our soldiers don't carry. They are used to this altitude. So I would say battlefield Tibet is a different ball game. Like I was telling William, he's a big man. I said, you can punch me, but if I'm six inches away, your arm won't reach me. So the mainland China is uh, 1,500, 2,000 kilometers away. Our mainland is Calcutta, 400 kilometers. That's why they prefer to come through Calcutta and go to Lhasa. They found it an easy route. So I would say uh, we are equal to the Chinese in every way. We'll defend our country. Chinese should not think of any other uh, action or misadventure in the future. Uh, now, if India and China get on to a constructive engagement, I believe that is the only way forward with dialogue and discussions and a constructive relationship can redefine the contours of the 
world equations of the power because this is the century of 21st century, the century of India and China. Uh, Shamsar, are you as optimistic about the uh, military and uh, the balance at the moment? Uh, let me uh, make the point that, uh, you know, while there has been an asymmetry of power between India and China, that is quite self-evident, um, <clears throat> two or three things have happened on our side. Over the last 15 years or so, there has been a very major effort made on the Indian side uh, to really build up our infrastructure uh, on this side of the border. Uh, because, you know, access to the line of control from the Indian side uh, is difficult. Because on the other side, you have the Tibetan Plateau, which is essentially flat. On the Indian side, you have to cross many ridges before you can get uh, to what I've heard descriptions that when the, the, they meet in the, uh, on the border, that the Indians come bumping over in a jeep while the Chinese yeah. arrive in a limousine. Uh, true. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, not every, each and every part of the border, but that's certainly true for uh, a considerable uh, stretch of the uh, border. So one is that the asymmetry of infrastructure uh, between the two sides as far as the border is concerned is less than what it was before. And that is one of the reasons why there are many more encounters, more frequent encounters between Chinese patrols and Indian patrols, which was not necessarily the case uh, before. The second uh, point is that uh, I would say that our capabilities, military capabilities are sufficient to prevent any further ingress by the Chinese side on the Indian side. But you know, of course, it would be a different ball game if you had to actually evict Chinese uh, from the areas that they have uh, occupied. Is it your impression as some newspapers are claiming that there is some land which has been lost in the last couple of years? Well, you know, it depends upon uh, what you consider to be the loss of land because, you know, there is also this, uh, this uh, uh, you know, theory about uh, the differences in perception as to where the uh, LAC lies. Now, uh, de 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 uh, depending upon what the difference in perception is, uh, we may have lost land, we may not have lost uh, land. Uh, so it, this is a bit of a fraught uh, situation with, but you know, there are, there are territories which you have lost, which is the whole of the Aksai chain. Okay. So, uh, you know, one cannot say that, you know, have the Chinese occupied uh, land. Have you occupied land in the recent operations? That is the issue. And that is, I think, difficult to uh, determine, but it is certainly true that s several areas which we used to patrol before, uh, and maybe the Chinese were also patrolling, today there are several areas where Indian patrols are blocked from going to the places which were patrolling earlier. That is certainly true. Tanzan, you've actually been living through quite a lot of lockdown in Shanghai. Are you, are you at all optimistic about the future of India-China relations? We've got to have a very quick answer to yeah, this. I mean, or uh, do you think that this military clash on the border is the shape of things to come? Yeah, I'm not interested in nation, what nation states do. I mean, I think they are important. But I'm looking at a very interesting phenomena where many Han Chinese are practicing Tibetan Buddhism. And they come to India on pilgrimage. And they repeat what Shwenzang said. I was in Nalanda and in Bodhgaya yeah, and, and last month. Hundreds of, hundreds yes, of Chinese. Yes, and, and, and yeah. this is an amazing phenomenon. No matter what the relationship between the two states is, I, I think what matters, as we see from the Chinese protests in December, are the people. And if the Chinese people are so interested in coming to India, and reviving that ancient uh, relationship, I think at some point it may matter. So if we can change the, the discourse from a state-oriented, you know, Hegel said China is all state and India is people without state, I, I think we need to come out of the discourse of emphasizing just the state, but there's a lot to be understood with, uh, with regard to the people. We have time for one question. Uh, I'm sorry, we've slightly overshot. In general, apologies if I didn't give you your full time. Uh, one interesting question. Lady in the front row here, just because you're immediately in my line of vision. The, the mic's not working. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much. This has been a really interesting, engaging discussion. A uh, question that I had was for all of you. We've talked about uh, a lot of different things, and there's suspicion, there's animosity. What I don't hear clearly is what do we do to move ahead? I know you talked about dialogue. But 
dialogue and communication perhaps may not be enough. What do you think decisively can we Shall do, do uh, to improve relations? Is Tibet, for example, an area, I know it's a bone of contention, but can that be used in a sensible way to move forward? Only if you can uh, move beyond the very deep insecurities that the Chinese have about their, uh, about their occupation of Tibet. Because, uh, you know, how do you, how do you have this conversation if the conversation is always about state control over Tibet and nothing to do with, you know, the kind of things that um, Tansen is talking about? You know, the things which unite us in terms of Buddhism, what Buddhists thought, uh, the sense of togetherness that that brings, um, that is missing. Everything that you have in the discourse today with China is all a state-oriented dialogue. It is all about security. It is all about defense. It is all about who has more influence in Asia uh, than, 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 than the Chinese do. I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, unless China moves away from that line of thinking, and to some extent, India too moves away from that line of thinking. Uh, it is very difficult to see what could be the meeting ground? Uh, William, can I have a word? Last Please, one. of course, General. Yeah. Um, Ma'am, just to add on to what uh, Ambassador Sean Saran has said, you see, ideologically, there is a clash which is not on the surface, but it's below the surface between a communist one party ruled country <laughs> like China with a supreme power being with Z, he's answerable to nobody and a democratic parliamentary system of governance of India. Question is, in this competition, if India succeeds, then the Communist Party of China is in trouble. And therefore, Xi Jinping is doing his very best to go back to Mao Zedong's kind of tactics and strategies with modern gadgets that he has at his disposal. So therefore, it's very important that this must be understood, that there is a subterranean competition going on, and the world is with us. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we have a strong wicket to bat on, that the world is with India now, not with China. General, just a quick question. One reads more and more about the Chinese taking rare earths, buying up all the minerals, surrounding India with the string of pearls. They bought, I think, Trincomalee, uh, Colombo Port, uh, Guada. Uh, the, the, sometimes it looks, when you look at maps of this, as if India is being surrounded by Chinese bought areas. What's India's response to that? Uh, I think you have made a very relevant point. Uh, that is why I said India is becoming smarter now. We have understood what our resources are and how we got exploited in the past. And now we are not allowing that to happen. Not only that, our affiliation, the moment we get close to Western powers like America or something, China gets the jitters. I can tell you, I saw it happen with the kick lighter uh, proposals in 2000, 1999 and all. 2000, moment we get close to America, uh, Chinese signed an agreement in 2005. Uh, Prime Minister Wen Biao signed that agreement with our Prime Minister, which said that many things they said were friendly, including settled populations will not be disturbed, which meant that Tawang remains with us, Demchok remains with them on the other side. Tawang is very important for us because Possibly the next Dalai Lama may come from the Tawang region of Monpa tribals whom I have seen and met as a governor there. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, we will be very careful how to uh, make up the gap between Chinese technological advance and ours. And Indian minds are much sharper, much brainier, and they will be able to catch up this distance quickly. That's why I have confidence. On, on that optimistic note, ladies and gentlemen, please, a huge round of applause for Tansen Sen, Shan Saran, and General JJ Singh. We'd like to thank all our panelists today, Tansen Sen, JJ Singh, Shan Saran, and William Dalrymple. Mr. Tansen Sen and JJ Singh will be signing the books at the... There is.